difficulties. I want to say welcome everyone to the webinar today. Uh, it is being provided by DSS Condo and the topic today is something we all have been uh, interested in and that is on solid building solid projects. Um, I just wanted to tell you that I looked up a little bit of information I found in the Times Herald Tallahassee uh, Bureau, they published that there are 2 million residents now living in condominiums and um, owners of these units will need to know, you know, quite a bit about how to budget and maintain adequate earnings, uh, I'm sorry, savings to pay for these repairs. So today, well, I'm hoping that everybody picks up some tips and some information from these two experienced experts at DSS Condo. Before we get started, I wanna introduce our sponsors. I'll start with myself. I am Peggy West, I'm the organizer of the webinar, but I also am a sales consultant for <clears throat> Beach and Patio Outdoor Living. Uh, right now we're running some great summer specials. We actually have an overstock on some of the uh, chase lounges and so on, but we offer full service from umbrellas, cabanas, new and we are restrapping furniture, we are reslinging furniture, repainting furniture. So anything that has to do with your pool deck furniture, please give me a, a chance to bid on it and I promise you I'll give you a great price. Uh, moving on now, I want to introduce Ventium Software. Today we have Yasmin Johannes. She is the marketing manager, uh, the IT support for the webinars. And uh, she does a great, phenomenal job. I want to say thank you, uh, Yasmin, and let you introduce Ventium and what you guys do. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Peggy. Uh, my name is Yasmin. I'm the marketing manager here at Ventium. Ventium Software has been in the market for 10 years now. We operate across North America. We have two products, Neighbors by Ventium, which is a management and communication platform. It provides private portals and websites for HOAs and condos. And we also have Inspections by Vintium, which is a solution for home and property inspections. It works on any device. You can use it from anywhere. And it works both online and offline. And I'll leave our contact details in the chat box so you can reach out to us if you're interested to, to learn more about our solutions. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Yasmin. And thanks again for all you do. Honorary mention for Ventium, I want to mention Layla Scola. She does quite a bit also. She is the head of customer success and marketing, and I appreciate her so much. So please tell her. Uh, next, I want to move on to Best Roofing. Uh, we have Diana Alert on. She's the business development director. Diana, tell us about yourself and uh, the company. Yes. Thank you, Peggy. Good afternoon. I'm Diana Allard. I'm the Business Development Manager at Best Roofing. Best Roofing is a company that has been in business for over 45 years. We call it Palm Beach, Broward, and Date. We do reproof, recovery, inspections, repairs, maintenance programs, anything in your roof, you name it. Even if you just want to find out the life expectancy of your roof, I can send someone for you to find out that. So I'm going to be leaving my information on the chat box for you. If you need me, please contact me and have a wonderful class. Thanks, Diana. I appreciate that. And please say hello to Greg. Uh, next, I want to introduce Patty J. Uh, she's with J.R. Fraser, and they do uh, the audits and our reserves. I'm sorry. Is Patty on? I don't see Patty on as yet. Well, if you're looking for someone to help you with the reserves, they are outstanding. Uh, following this webinar, I will be sending out a sponsor sheet and it will have all of the sponsors name and contact information. So Patty's information will be on there. Uh, they've been around for a long time. I want to say over 30 years. So very experienced. Next, I want to introduce Hafer Company. Uh, Nicole Johnson is the partner and operations manager. They are CPA service, full service with six offices around the state of Florida. Uh, she is on an appointment also. Uh, Sherwin Williams is another sponsor of ours today. Sergio Roncancio, he's the business development manager. Uh, he does run a nice region. And Sherwin Williams, everybody hears about them on other commercials and so on. Very reputable company. If you're looking, I know it's budget's time. If you're looking for a, a price uh, budget for painting, that would be Sergio. 
Uh, next, I want to introduce Empire Works Reconstruction. Uh, Nikki Smith is on. She's a business development director. And Nikki, tell us about yourself and what you guys do for condominiums. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the warm introduction, Peggy. So we're Empire Works Reconstruction. We are a full service GC, so we handle everything on the exterior envelope. We also specialize in construction defect. So we do waterproofing, deck work, paving work, uh, facade restoration, you name it. We also have our senior estimator on the call, Anthony, as well. He's well-versed in all things estimating, so please don't hesitate to give us a call when it comes to any of your capital improvement projects and your milestone repairs. Awesome. Anthony, would you like to say a few words? Tell us about yourself, your experience. Hey all, my name is Anthony. I'm the senior estimator of Empire Works. Um, so we are a corporate uh, a general contractor. So we do have a nation account with most of our vendors. Our pricing is very competitive. We make sure that we are competitive when we submit any type of pricing budgets or bids uh, because we do honor our costs with our nationwide accounts. Um, so in restoration, as Nikki said, we do all type of restoration. It could be from waterproofing of pool decks, of, of envelope facades. It could be a, a concrete repairs, expansion joints, painting. We also do garages, uh, any type of waterproofing and concrete that's needed for a, a full restoration of a building. Uh, we also do DTs. Uh, we work alongside uh, various engineers like M2 Engineering, Epic Engineering. And we also um, assist during the exploration work before they create some type of, of RFP or repair protocol. Um, along with uh, when there's a bid form, when the engineer creates the bid and creates the scope of work that the GC has to perform in order to restore the building, we also provide uh, logistics phasing and staging plans uh, to the client. That way they know our approach and we also provide something they call a Gantt chart schedule. It's like a bar schedule that shows how long the project is going to take and how long each task is going to last. And again, um, we have our information. If there's any type of, of, of repair that's needed, if, if there's any restoration work that's needed, you can always contact us and we'll be more than happy to stop by and uh, further assist. Okay, thanks, Anthony. And you should add Socatec. Uh, engineering to your uh, repertoire of companies to reach out to because they recently uh, purchased DSS and uh, are partnering together. So that'd be a great uh, engineering firm to also consider. Uh, next, I want to introduce uh, Nuvo Elevators. Uh, is Erica on? I know she contacted me earlier. Okay, so Erica uh, Deft is the contact. She's the business development director. Uh, again, she will be on the sponsor sheet. Uh, next, I want to introduce RMS Building Envelope Company by Ricardo Moncado. He was the president and chief inspector. Uh, Ricardo, can you tell us about yourself and what you guys do? Thank you, Peggy. Uh, yes, my name is Ricardo Moncada with RMS Building Emo Consultants. We uh, we are not contractors. We are consultants. We sit on the building owner's side of the table to protect their best interest. We um, provide assessments and we write the specifications that some of the contractors that are present in the uh, in this uh, presentation will come and put a price on. And uh, we help the owners through the, the bidding process, contractor selection, quality assurance, to make sure that you get the most value out of your uh, roofing and waterproofing projects. So uh, we do work with uh, engineering firms and, and roofing and waterproofing contractors to make sure that um, you get what you pay for. Thank you. Absolutely, a long-term experience. Uh, Ricardo's got over 35 years of experience coming from a manufacturing company rep before he opened his own business. So a lot of reputable companies on here that can help you with your milestone uh, projects that are going on. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn this over to today's moderator, which is Suli Encolada. She's the business development director 
but uh, also today's moderator. And I just want to mention some housekeeping is if you have a question, put it into the Q&A box. If you have a comment, put it in the chat box. And again, I will send out a sponsor sheet. So Suli, I'll let you take it over, introduce uh, your speakers for today. And I wanna thank you guys in advance. All right, thank you, Peggy. I think uh, we have Ben, uh, I think we skipped Ben, one of the sponsors that was um, oh, on I'm the sorry. list. Oh, sorry. Is Ben on the... On That's fine. I think he joined a little bit later, but uh, I see that Ben is on. So I want oh, to okay. give him a chance to talk. <laughs> Absolutely. Ben, I'm sorry. I didn't see you on. Uh, ben Friedman is the president of City Quiet. Ben, tell us about yourself and your company. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Suli, thank you for always looking out for me. Um, <laughs> yeah. My name is Ben Friedman. I'm the president and owner of City Quiet Windows and Doors. Um, I apologize. I'm in my car, but um, we have four uh, office locations of which I am visiting two today um, here in Fort Myers Beach, as well as in Naples. That's where I am right now. Um, our headquarters is in Boca and we have an office in North Miami. We provide turnkey white glove service for all window, door, storefront and railing projects. Um, we're very, very involved in the rebuild here on the West Coast from Hurricane Ian. And, uh, on the West Coast, excuse me, and uh, on the East Coast, we're very entrenched uh, with the milestone inspections and how windows and doors and waterproofing tie into that. So uh, I appreciate you guys always including me and uh, look forward to uh, today's presentation. Thank you. Okay, Suli, introduce your uh, key people there and let's take it away. Hi. Right. Thank you, Peggy, and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Building Solid Project. Uh, my name, like Peggy mentioned, is Suli Encalada, and I'm the Director of Business Development uh, for DSS Condo, at now a division of Stock Attack. Uh, we are a complete project management company. We have been in business since 2014. We work strictly with condo associations as your project managers or owners rep. Uh, we help, we work with them, assisting them in um, with the project from inception to completion, we believe that with the right project manager on board, a property manager can help the condominium association uh, run the renovation project more smoothly, coming on time and within budget, and cause far less disruption to the residents. So presenting our webinar today, we have our chief operating officer, Michael Poe, and our project executive, Katie Cotto. Combined, they have over 20 years of experience in construction and project manager. So obviously they are the right people to be talking about this topic today, which is uh, you know the project budget. So I will now turn them over to our panelists and they will take it over for the presentation. Michael and Haiti. Thank you very much for introduction, Suli. So again, yes, my name is Michael Poe. I am the CEO of DSS Condo and I'm here with Haiti, one of our project executives as well, should be a helping me through this process. It's, it's quite a detailed, lengthy presentation, which is very important, but I Let's just want to- call it interesting. Exactly, interesting okay. presentation. So I just want to make sure I have the professionals here actually know what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> With that, I just want to uh, warn everybody, we are having some technical difficulties. So yes. unfortunately, Suli's actually the one sharing this. So I'm gonna have to be telling her next. So you're gonna hear that a lot. It's not part of the presentation, I promise you. Okay, right, so with that being said, guys, okay, so again, we have our presentation for building a solid project budget. It's a, it's very important uh, reason we, you know, we, we stress this topic very much is because we are called on several projects uh, that are ongoing, and when we get in there, one of the first things we find that's just gone crazy is the budget, and when we actually ask, well, hey, well provide us your budget, let us take a, a quick glance at it. It's just, it's missing so much. And it's, you know, something that if from the beginning we would have seen, we would have said, this is not accurate. Or it's non-existent sometimes. Correct. Are we still sharing? No, we're not. Suli, are you sharing? Yes. It's not sharing. Enlarge it. It's not sharing. Right Guys, give us one second. For some reason, our screen stopped sharing. So Mike went to fix that. But as we were mentioning, some of the things that we find a lot when we walk into a project is either there is no budget or we defined budget as just the cost to build. 
right? And when a budget is truly so much more. So with this course, what we're hop hoping to accomplish is educate everybody a little bit more as far as the requirements in order to build a solid project budget. Give us just two seconds and then we'll get right back to the class. Hopefully this is the last time this happened. Apologies, some kicked me out. Peggy, worst case scenario, if Zoom kicks us out one more time, just for the sake of saving everybody's time, could we maybe send you the presentation and have you share the screen? Because it might be our office that the internet may be acting up. We're not very sure. I mean, everything else is working, but just in case. You can send the, the slides to me if you want, and I can share them. I yeah, I think that might be an option. Just in case it kicks us back mm -hmm. again, we can try it that way. Yeah, of course. All right, so I'm going to print the slides and then I'll send them to you. All right, Jasmine? Perfect. There. It's there now. So what we're going to do is we're going to send them to Jasmine, just in case. And that way, if it kicks us out one time we'll all right chat. apologies we're okay. back on okay and i think you should just continue reading the slides or whatever going forward so we can Apo catch up. apologies all right so currently we're on the agenda i see so apologies about that so now on the agenda so on today's agenda we have what a solid budget can do for you a little bit of budget terminology so you truly understand what that is and then two separate approaches on how on to develop these budgets, two types of budgets that can be used for different reasons, different types of projects. Um, and the last, obviously, we have a, a Q&A. Next slide, Suli. Suli. All right, so I'm waiting for Suli. There you go. Just a little delayed. A little slow. So what a solid project budget can do for you. All right, so some of the things that you get out of building these projects, uh, these budgets, it's not only the fact that you're building the budget, is taking the steps to do so is going to help you to better understand the work. One of the reasons is if literally to build a budget, you, it forces you to mentally walk through the project from start to finish. In order to, you have to do that in order to build this project, because you have to understand what the project means for your building specifically. How does it affect your building? If we're working in the areas of, a, of, a, of corridors, if we're removing carpeting and baseboard, does it affect the unit owners? Does it affect that we have to go into the units? Are we going to need additional security? Things of that. So you really want to walk through the project itself in your head. It helps you anticipate issues, possible outcomes. Basically, it helps you stay one, you know, one step ahead of the game. It's going to help minimize chaos and maintain control. Because again, you understand your project. Just from building this budget, by the time you get to the end, you understand this entire project more so than the majority. You're gonna be able to explain to others how it affects their building and why you're entering the information. Helps give the board of directors a realistic and accurate picture of project costs from the beginning. From the moment you're getting into the project, you don't have to wait to the end to really come up with that, understand that. And most of all, it helps going having to go back to the community for more funds. You don't wanna to go to the well twice, you go once. You wanna be able to build this project budget, have it in place, and not have to look back again. Just understand that you, you took all the steps required in order to properly come up with this budget. All right, next slide, Suli. So on the next slide, and as it goes getting there, I'm just gonna keep speaking, but we're gonna talk about a little bit of terminology. I just wanna read these three off to you because this is what we're gonna be going over in the slides as it continues. The first one is soft costs. So you're gonna hear this a lot when it comes to budgets. You're going to hear a lot of it's coming from your project manager, someone like DSS. At times, you may not hear so much from other individuals because typically soft costs, what we see when we see these budgets of jobs have commenced already is that soft cost is overlooked a lot of times. Mm -hmm. It's something that's missed. So they come in here, you know, people tell you, okay, well, I have my budget. Well, how'd you get that number? Well, the budget's $2 million, okay? And that came from, oh, the contractor's bid. 
Well, that's not your budget. That's your hard costs. You completely missed the soft costs. And the last thing you're going to hear is contingency, which again, at times is one of those things that's not included. It's overlooked and it's missed. So we want to make sure that you understand this terminology of soft costs, hard costs, contingency. All that is needed in a requirement of a properly executed budget. Next slide, Sully. So the first one we're going to talk about is soft costs. Okay, so here in soft costs, you have are basically expenses associated with your project besides the solid bid numbers, besides what we just mentioned, the, those hard costs. The most common mistake we see again is soft costs being overlooked or essential soft costs. Things, certain things may be missed. For example, some soft costs include your project manager, PSS. It includes security, additional security if needed. It includes anything that's not truly that hard cost from permitting to uh, performance and payment bonds. It includes valet if you have to bring in valet service. Again, anything that's not the hard cost. And generating these soft costs and developing and coming up with these soft costs, at times you may say, okay, I, I just don't know what those are. I don't know where to get these from. Well, the idea is that it's just that. You want to be able to walk yourself through the project. Going back to the steps we had earlier, or actually walking through the project and truly understanding it. And as we move on, we'll help you we'll give you some ideas of what those are. So as you can see here <laughs> on how to identify some of the soft costs. So it's, you know, it's, so if you want, you can just spread them all out, but it literally drops down again. But <laughs> knowing where your soft costs will be before the project starts can be tricky. Especially if this is the first time you have undertaken a project like this. So for the majority of you, it may be some of you may already have or you, and you remember some of the mistakes or some of the things that were overlooked in the past. So but again, some of the call it, uh, you know, how to identify some of these soft costs or some tips or just your knowledge, for example, create a schedule. Creating a schedule, how that helps with soft costs is because having the knowledge and understanding what the, how long the project's going to be. Now you know the duration for your engineering services. You know the duration for additional management of needed security. You know the duration for your project management team. Now you could go ahead and take their number right across the board for the duration of that project. And you have a true understanding of what that soft cost is. Again, items that are typically missed because they're not considered. People say, well, I have my engineering. You know, he's going to charge me X amount of dollars to develop these drawings and, and get us a bid package. Yeah, but you're missing the actual construction. He needs to be there to perform inspections. And you, in order to understand what that cost is, you need a schedule. The next item is walk the job site. Now, again, walking the job sites, understanding the job sites to build a soft cost. Now, do you have some reason some of why you would walk the job site to establish soft costs? Yeah. So, for example, let's say that you are doing concrete restoration. And, and I actually have this going on in one of my projects, Mike, where I'm doing concrete restoration. And during my concrete restoration, I actually have to shore up the entrance to the building. So now my entrance to the building had to be moved, but it cannot stay unguarded. So essentially, my security guard has to say exactly where he is. But I have to add additional security guards in order to create new entrances and exits to the building. So thank goodness we identified this added maintenance soft cost and accounted for it within our budget. So now we have to budget to add the additional personnel. That's just one instance where you might need it. Exactly. It's all about, again, coming back to it, the first one, thinking through the process, but walking the site. What, what How does it affect the site? Does it affect the pool, entrance to the pool? Do I need security for the pool? Yep. Do I have it? Does it affect my garage, a garage restoration project? Well, how would that affect the garage? Mm -hmm. Parking. Where are they going to park? Do we have to rent a space across the street? Do we have to hire valet? Do we have, is it a cost that we're not thinking yeah. about? We're not contemplating right now, but we should. Or even cleanliness, right? So you may need additional housekeeping. If you're doing a beautification project, even though the contractors generally supposed to clean up after themselves, we all know in construction projects, they may still leave some mess behind. Do you need additional housekeeping? Do you need additional personnel? If you need to enter a unit, in order to do, say, a sprinkler or fire alarm project. So these are items that as you walk through the job site and you decompose the project in your mind, you'll come to realize, hey, it's it's not just a cost to build. There is added cost I may encounter. Exactly. So the next one you have there is meet the players. 
So meet the players, what does that mean? It's meet the potential contractors, the ones bidding, meet the engineer, uh, get an understanding from them. Keep in mind, this is not what you do on a, for a daily basis. You have your job. You understand how to do yours, but ask them theirs. You ask the Mr. Contractor, you know, this type of project, we want to do a restoration of tower, you know, based on what you've seen so far, what do you, you know, what do you estimate the uh, duration to be? You know, if you ask him pricing, he may not tell you that until he actually submits a bid, but duration, he'll tell you. Or how do you how do you see it affecting the building? You know, what are you going to need from us? What are we going to have to change of our daily lives here to accommodate you and the work? You know, things like that. Those are the questions you want to ask. You know, discuss expectations. Uh, review other budgets. So review other budgets, what does that mean? You know, a lot of you work for, for large firms or large companies that, ha that are, have property managers on other buildings that have undergone this type of work, that know this type of work, that have created a budget or actually have missed items on a budget. Uh, but at the end of the day, going to them and, other, and getting that feedback from them is going to assist you in developing those line items that may potentially affect you. You're, you could, it could even be your neighboring building. <clears throat> Especially the if they've had projects of similar nature than the one that you're trying to create. Exactly. Uh, Breakdown cost by category. So, Suli, if you could spread those out. <clears throat> so, breaking it down by category is going to help you now fill in the blanks, Colin. So if you have these categories, you have your design professionals, mm -hmm. which again is your engineer, your architect, your designer, whether it's landscape designing or, or, or interior designer, any, any type of design professional, mechanical, electrical, consultants. Here come your consultants, your consultants being DSS Condo, your consultants being your life safety consultants. If you're doing an engineer life safety system, which is the ELSS. Your elevator consultant, if you're doing an elevator project. Those are your consultants. You're going to build them into those sections. Now you have administrative. Well, administrative falls into what you need, call it back of the house, whether it's additional management, additional security, clean, you know, cleaning uh, to clean up the site. If you need, a lot of you have your, uh, you may have accounting in-house, but you, some of you don't. So accounting is one thing you could put on there for something you pay for. You also have your law firm, the attorneys that are going to help you build these contracts. Mm -hmm. You definitely want to have your attorney help you build a contract. Please, I can't stress that enough. Have your attorney help you build the contract for you. Don't sign theirs. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, so all those are fall under a category of administrative. Now you go to permits. You know you have to pay for permits. And then, you know, for those of you who haven't taken on one of these large projects, permits are typically not included as part of the contractor's cost. Reason being, they don't know what it's going to cost. They could give you an allowance, but that's not really a matter of fact, finite number. So you want to have a budget for that. So for permits, typically we'll include a percentage. You know, we'll give the cities a call. We'll understand what more or less what they charge, whether it's a 2.5, a three, a three and a half percent. And we'll plug that into our budget, which then later on, once we have our hard, hard costs, it's going to do the formula for us and let, it, let it us know, okay, permits are going to cost X. Um, you know, it goes on, et cetera. But a couple other items are your bond. Mm -hmm. If you have a large project, you're going to want to bond your project. Yep. So you have payment and performance bond. You want to include a percentage for that. Insurances. Insurances. Builder's risk insurance on a building. If you're taking on a large project, you're going to want to you know, call, contact your agent and get some builder's risk insurance put on the building for the duration of the project. All those line items are basically soft costs. Now, I understand it's you may think to yourself, well, wait, this is a long list. And by the way, if you reach out to us, we're more than happy to send you a list of what potential soft costs are, because I know it's a long list. But the idea is just when you sit down and you think, it's that it's anything that's not hard cost. That's all it is. Yep. It's just literally anything that is not hard cost. Hard cost is basically the simplest way to put them. We'll show you later on. If it ends with the word contractor in it, it's a hard cost. Electrical contract, general contract, the roofing contract. It's a hard cost. It's what it costs to build, to literally get the hammer and hit it. Yep. That's what hard cost is. Everything else is a soft cost. Now, Suda, you go to the next slide. And the best way well, Suli does that, guys, to identify your soft costs, and we can't stress it enough, is something that we even use with our project managers and our APMs, something we train them to do is break down the project. If you can do it in your mind, great, but write it down. Create a list as you work, as you walk your project, create a list. Suli, don't, Suli, go back, go back. Thank you, right there. there. Leave it there for a second. You can go to just the next blank screen. 
So and then uh, this next area section here, I actually want to ask you guys, I mean, typically we, we like doing this in person where we hand you a little pan for the booklet. You're going to write it down. We're going to call you in front of the class and make sure and put you in front of everybody to answer this. This is a test. Okay. But here we want you, I'm going to give you a, a scenario and I want, we want you guys to, to enter in the comment section, the chat section, a few soft calls, what you believe soft calls would be. We'll give you five minutes or so to do it. And then we'll see, we'll read off what some of those are and then we'll share some of what we have. All right, so consider, consider this situation. The association is gonna remodel the lobby of the building due to water loss. Now, besides the cost of the contractor's fee of the work, which is hard cost, mm -hmm. what soft costs will you need to account for? I just wanna think it through. You know, it, the association is gonna remodel, so it's not just repairing the, the, the water loss or the damage to water, you're taking the lobby, it's filled with water, water came in, there's water loss. They're just going to take an opportunity now to correct that, but while while they're probably beautified. So I'll say take five minutes. If you could just enter a few in the chat, we'll see here what they are. We have both good answers, answers here. here. All right, so typically we give like five minutes or 10, but you guys are very quick. Because apparently this thing just continues, it's just growing so fast. <laughs> so, all right, so I'll go ahead and read off a few that I see here. So we have structural engineering. Yes, if it's a requirement to soft cost. Test the material, if it's a requirement to soft cost. Trash removal. Yes, could be a soft cost. Because some may think, so trash removal, some of these other ones, that's one actually that can that can become confusing because you say, okay, well, wouldn't the GC do that portion and not be under their hard cost for building? In a sense, yes. If his drawings, his scope of work says, demo this area, you're in charge of trash removal, get it out. But if the trash removal is due to the water or the damage that caused that you're now doing an association, it is not a hard cost to build anything back. You're doing this because it's part of it. So yes, it would be considered a soft cost. Engineering fees. Design costs. Design cost. Hey, mold testing. Very good. There you yes. go. Yes. Possible mold testing, permits. We got trash, plastic protection. Great. 100%. Yep. Building materials, permits, permits. Move to alternate entrance. Yes. Yes, that's a big one. And the security associated with it. Loss of use, floor protection, extra staff, auxiliary services like valet, permit. You guys are great. We don't need this course. They can probably teach this class. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So, <clears throat> what, but Suli, if you can, just please populate the page. Take it to... A plus, guys. A plus. So now you're going to see on here a lot of the items you guys just listed. You know, from call it floor protection. That was there. You know, staff overtime, furniture removal, supplies, security, safety equipment. These are all soft costs. Now, so this was the, you know, I, I saw earlier in the chat, there's a lot of questions in regards to, well, give us, is there a list of the soft costs, something we could put? Yes, there is, and we're happy to share. But you guys just took less than five minutes to think about it. You took the time to say, hold on, let me picture this job. And you came up with more items than we have. So at the end of the day, it's possible. You can do it, it can be done. It just need, the step needs to be taken. That's simply what it, what it is. All right, so Suli, go on to the next slide. All right, so this next one is a very, it's a tough one. It's hard cost. So like I said earlier, anything that ends with contractor, it's what it costs to build. It's, it's if you're changing your windows. You have the engineering developed ahead of time. You have the yep. permitting for it, but now your contractor comes in, you know, gives you a great price on windows. You say, okay, well, what's your contract? You know, two hundred thousand dollars. That's hard cost. Yep. So hard cost is what it cost me to get the contractor here from beginning to end, get the windows out and new ones in. 
And this is actually <clears throat> what we typically encounter when we walk into a project. The <laughs> hard costs have been accounted for. It's the soft cost that's a bit of a struggle, along with what comes next. That's true. So, Suli, what comes next? What's the next slide? Contingency. Yeah, as Heidi just mentioned, said earlier, contingency is also one of those items that's overlooked. So contingency, you know, contingency, it's a cushion. It's a safety net. It's a sa it's a savings account. It's whatever you want to put. But it's what you need to understand is that contingency is a requirement. It's not an option on a budget. It is a requirement. Now, the question we get asked a lot is, well, I get it. I have to put contingency, but what am I putting? What percentage? What makes sense? That's a great question. And really in regards to what makes sense. So, you know, they say, is there, you know, a, a typical percentage you use across the board? And the answer is no, there's not. There's not a typical percentage. It's based on the complexity of the project, mm -hmm. the amount of what we foresee as unknowns. Excuse me, that, you know, if you're, if you're doing a call it concrete restoration building or a tower, a facade, just because it's concrete restoration, we know there's a lot of unknowns. It's it's a it's a big thing. They're on notes. But what's the condition of the building? I mean, have we walked this building? Do we understand it? Do we do we see minimal repair requirements? You know, we don't feel the unknown is going to be such so large. No. So we don't want to, you know, put a huge amount of contingency because then what the, what that does is now you're going to your residence and you're going to your assessing or getting a loan and you're charging them for a budget with a very high contingency that was not required, not needed. So you just took more money that you did not need to take. So, you know, typically I would say concrete restoration, if you just want to have a number in your head for hard costs, for, you know, a job project, a full tower needs work and you see it needs work, you could average more or less about 20% or so. We start messing with it back and forth, lower or higher, depending what we feel based on our expertise and our understanding of the building. And then you also want to have a contingency for soft costs. So here in this slide, we literally show just one section of, of contingency. But again, that's just to simplify this budget so you understand the breakdown. But right. the way we truly build our budgets in houses, we're going to have a separate contingency for soft costs and one for hard costs. We want to divide that. We want to know what our true budget is for each section. And sometimes, depending on the project, even within the hard costs, <clears throat> we'll have different contingencies. Because let's say, for example, I have a property where we are doing an HVAC project. Uh, concrete restoration project and a beautification project, right? Now we've walked all three projects and we figured on the concrete restoration project, I'm gonna need a much higher contingency because in this particular project, there was a lot of unknowns. There was no destructive testing done beforehand. So the specifications were a little bit empty. We came into the project after contracts were signed. We need a higher contingency versus the HVAC and beautification projects, which were pretty straightforward and there were not many unforeseen. So to be fair to the community, we calculated different contingencies for the different hard costs. All right, so with that being said, now we're gonna move on. So we've kind of gone through what a budget is made of. You know, the, the terminology, what that terminology means, how you get that, if, how you gather that information. So the next thing, the next thing we're gonna discuss now and take you to is the types of budgets. Correct. Two different types of budget we want to walk you through. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think Heidi's going to go ahead and walk you through that budget to design that first one there. So I'll, I'll let yeah. her go. So you do have two types of budgets when you're looking at a building, right? You budget to a design and then you have a design to budget. Most people like to begin with budget to design. Most communities that we walk into like to begin a budget to design. And the structure of budget to design is very simple. So before we move to breaking down each of these items, Budget to design is just, you start with a vision, you move on to design cost, then hard cost, then soft cost, contingency, and voila, you have a budget. So you can move to next. So usually you will use a budget to design. It will be required for you to use a budget to design for required projects. Yeah, what are required projects? Yeah, sometimes you're forced. Basically. Sometimes you're forced it's, to use not budget an option. to design. It's not optional. Right. In the cases that it's not optional, it's when you have city requirements, you have a structural repair project, you have an ELSS project that's mandated by the city. Even the windows, glass and glazing can be a required project by your insurance company. So in that case, you have to budget to a design because you have to meet 
city code, right? You have to meet code, state code. You have to meet code. Uh, likewise, your 40-year recertification, your 50-year, your 10-year milestone. These are old required projects where specifications will be built and you kind of have to abide by them. But, so we go to the next one, you can use this budget to design for beautification projects as well. So unlike the cartoon for required projects where the guy is telling his employee not enough money is being spent on safety, so be careful. Don't do that. You don't have that option don't when do it that. comes to budget to design. No. <laughs> I mean, even if you had the option, don't well, do that. I mean, that. you do that either way, but I mean, budget but design, you're forced to do the project. With budget to design, you're forced to do the project, and it, the cost is kind of what it is. However, because you can use this project also for a beautification project, the beautification project is, let's say, for the sake of an example, and so you can go to the next one, you're going to start with a vision. So for the sake of this breakdown, we'll say that you are the property manager of Luxo Condo by the Sea Association. And Luxo Condo would like a barbecue project. Before you even start with the barbecue project and before you start hiring people, the first thing you need is a vision. So what is a vision? A vision is a narrow down step-by-step -step of what you would like to have at the end of the project. So what does the association want? It can become a pretty lengthy process because it's subject to a different array of interpretations. Suli, you can go to the next slide. So this is where your budgeting and business brains meet together. So you're going to need to think of managing your committees. You may have a design committee, you may have a construction committee, an approval committee, and we know committees can get a little bit out of hand. So in this case, for the purposes of the example, we're building a barbecue, right? So we're going to get together with our committees and we're going to figure out exactly what do we want to see on this barbecue? Do we want state-of-the-art appliances? Where do we want it? How do we want it to look? What needs to be the design? You can go to the next um, slide, Sully. And then we arrive to design committee meeting number 398 with absolutely no progress. How many of us have seen that happen? I know I have. <laughs> I we think, probably all have. I actually think that photo was taken in design committee one. I mean, probably, <laughs> but it, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's the same phase for all 400 oh, meetings. Okay. They're great meetings. It's going to be the same. <laughs> so as we know, they can be stressful. Everybody has their own personal opinion. Everybody has their own personal design taste. Everybody has their own way of seeing things. It's important for you to guide them through this process, through these committee meetings, whether it be the board president and the property manager, whether it be that you appoint one person to drive these meetings, piece of advice, don't go to the next point until the previous one has reached a conclusion. Because what will happen is you'll get to committee meeting 398 and your face will remain the same, if not a little bit redder, <laughs> because these get worse, not better. So help them stay focused. So you can go to the next slide. Now, once your association, after 565 meetings, your design committee or your construction committee or your board has gotten to their vision. This is what we want this barbecue to look like. The first element in building your budget is going to be your designer. Now you have a clear vision you need somebody to execute that vision and put it into a way that you can present to your membership. Keep in mind, sometimes these modifications may require a material alteration vote. So step one is going to be designing the vision. That's gonna be done by your designer. So we go next. Now for your designer, you're gonna to have to create an RFP. And by the way, an RFP is a request for proposal. It's essentially a written invitation, right there on the screen, written invitation for bids on a project uh, containing a detailed scope of work, 
and uh, quality response and to assure quality. The more with RFPs, the more detailed you can have on your request for proposal, the better off you will be when building your budget. If you do not give a clear vision of what the designer needs to design or what your design professionals need to give you, you're going to end up with a convoluted um, a convoluted estimate that's not going to be accurate and is open to change orders. So it's very important if you can give them, uh, go prior, Suli, if you can give them, like in the screen, you can give them a description of the job site where you want for the sake of the barbecue example, where you want the barbecue located? Is there anything in the way? Is there any particulars? Like for example, let's say you wanna build your barbecue, but there is no plumbing no connections by your barbecue. There is no electrical run where your barbecue is. These are all items that you need to include on your RFPs so that your designers and your design professionals can have a good idea of what they're going to be facing. If you can even bring them on site, and this is something that we do a lot, is we do a pre-bid meeting. The second we send out the request for proposal, we bring the designers and the personnel on site and we take them to the area of work. We describe exactly what we want, exactly what the RFP says, and we show them the area. Out of these meetings, nine times out of 10, we get a long list of questions that we have to provide answers to in order for the RFP to be accurate on their estimate. Now, Sully, you can go next. Now, you've sent out your RFP, you've received responses, it's time to select a designer. When selecting your designer, when selecting any construction professional, I cannot stress the importance of interviews. Please interview your construction professionals. Your lowest bid is not always your best bid. Sometimes it can be, but it's not always your best bid it's important that you get face-to-face -face with these design professionals and not just any design professional, the person who is actually going to be working on your project. Request the designer, the project manager, the engineer, whoever is going to be in charge of your project. Make sure you get face-to-face -face with them. Why? You want to make sure that whomever you are selecting, regardless, regardless of their bid price, will have a good um, chemistry with your board members is somebody that is willing to help you that wants to see your vision come to fruition, not push their own agenda. Yeah, which I was going to add, I mean, it is absolutely correct. And I can't stress enough when it comes to designers of meeting them in person, having the questions asked, because yes, as Heidi mentioned, we do recommend that you do that with all professionals, your contractor, your engineer, whoever it may be, but designers, mm -hmm. If this is a project you want to do and you don't, you know, you just want to give it to a designer and have them design it and you know that they're the best in the industry because you've seen them in magazines, or whatever it may be, and that's the route you're taking, then okay, give it to them, let it design it, you're going to do whatever they give you. But if you know you have a committee or you have people that want to be involved and want to put their two cents in, then you want to make sure you're meeting with this designer and you're asking them those questions. You're saying, look, you know, how do you guys feel when you give us a design that we come back with our comments? We want to make corrections, you know, and knowing our staff, our, the people in our room here, we may go back and forth a couple of times. Are you guys open to that? Or are you, you know, one correction type of company? You want to ask those questions. You yep. want to make sure you're picking the right individual, the right firm for your project. Yep. So a couple of tips to look out for when selecting a designer, like Mike was saying, make sure that it's a person that will fit your project and your demographics. Personality and flexibility are important. You don't want a designer to come in and say, well, I get it. Your vision's great. I have my own. And I'm just going to do my thing. If that is the case, you may want to consider. You may be okay with it, but you may want to consider the involvement of your committees, like Mike was mentioning. Make sure that the designer has worked with associations. Just because they are a top-notch designer in new construction does not mean... They're going to be a top-notch designer with associations. It's an entirely different ballpark. New construction, they do as they please. Associations, as you all know, everything has to be run through the board and the design committee meetings, and everybody has a very important opinion that is right. Ask for a cap monthly fee. So 
A lot of money is spent in construction administration when it comes to your design professionals. Make sure that you have a capped monthly fee, not a cap with a notice in order to exceed, but a cap period and none to exceed monthly fee. So that is the way to protect yourself. Avoid fees that are a percentage of the project. Please. It does not incentivize the design professionals to save you or value engineer anything. Think about it. If the way that I'm making money is by your project costing more money, you advocate for the project to cost more money. They're going to give you the top of the cream and tell you there's no other option because that's how they're making their money. Make sure you do not have fees that are a percentage of the project. Another important tip, involve the association's attorney in the process. Please do not sign anybody's contract. <laughs> have your association attorney draft the contract for you. If you have an owner's rep, such as DSS Condo, that's something that we get involved in as well. We review the contracts with you and with your attorney. We make sure that you're protected. Make sure you review your contracts. You know what your community needs best of all. To make sure that you are reviewing the contract with the attorney prior to signing it. And the last point, make sure that the association owns the design. Yeah, guys, and that and that whole owning the design doesn't only go for, I know we're you know, talking about interior design this year, but that goes for all type of design professionals. Yep. You know, whether they be architectural, engineering, you want to make sure in there it says that as they're paid for the portion of work, you say, you know, they have a fee to, to design and produce drawings for you. Once paid, you now own those drawings. By owning those drawings makes means that you owe the CAD files. You're able to use that and modify mm -hmm. as needed moving forward. If they own the drawings, then later on they'll tell you, well, if you decide to let us go, you, you're on your own. You can't take our design. Mm -hmm. So you just want to make sure you it's in that contract that and they're okay with saying, yes, you own the design. It's yours. And this is one of the ways that we get to a huge problem. I'm sure everybody has. It's a lack of records. So by ensuring that you own the design and that you can actually keep those drawings and file those drawings, you are helping yourself in creating records for times to come. So you can go next. And now that you have your vision. You select the super design. It's going to be great. They're going to give you a super design. <laughs> <laughs> now you have your vision okay. and you have your designer car. So you plug them into your budget. You can go next to lead. So the next step is the execution of the design, your hard cost. So again, you're going to create another RFP because now you need a price in order to execute this design. This is your second RFP for the sake of this project, but it might actually be RFP number five. Like I mentioned, if you had plumbing needs, you may have to send a designer RFI, a mechanical MEP RFI, you may have to send a structural RFI if you have structural needs on the project. For the sake of this one, let's say it's RFP number two. The next slide shows all of them. And the next slide actually, so legal next. You may need a plumber. Now you may need a plumber, you may need an electrician. So these are all RFIs that you're gonna have to create. Again, that's request for proposal. So on the actual execution of the work, you're gonna send out your request for proposal same information, except this time, you may have, may not have, but may have uh, already your design created. If you do, kudos to you. That's the best way to go because your RFP will be more complete. The goal of sending a request for proposal to a contractor is to feed them with as most information about the project they're going to have to build as you possibly can. So they can give you the best possible estimate. Go next. Now, once you receive your estimates back, your proposals, you're going to create a bid analysis. Why is it important? In this example, we are using a more compacted bid analysis. Generally, we use a um, very broken down by scope, by material, by area bid analysis. This is a bit more compacted, but it's important that you create it so you can show your board and association a comparison for each. So for this example, you have Mr. Contractor 1, 2, and 3. We don't recommend bidding any less than 5. The way the construction industry, and 5 I would say is conservative, the way the construction industry is right now, 
out of five, you're probably going to get two. Out of eight, you're probably going to get five. New times. Yep. Everybody slammed with work. So for this sake, you have constructor one, two, and three, along with uh, the line items and their respective prices and their tools. For the sake, go, silly, go next. For the sake of our example, uh, you're going to select Mr. Contractor. Mr. Contractor has been selected. Now you plug them into your hard cost, which is again, the costs build. Now you need to think about your additional soft costs. Remember, it's not just your designers. So you can go next. And in talking about that list that Mike was talking about and mentioning, you may have administrative costs associated with this barbecue. Administrative costs can include accounting, legal fees, additional office personnel, parking, valet, staff overnight, printing. You may have security needs like the security equipment, security guards, security supervisors, cameras, safety equipment. So you can go next. And we keep going. <laughs> Insurance and permits, uh, professional services, miscellaneous out of the professional services the most important is your project manager and then so you can go next for those of you who are asking do we have a list yes that's there you go we have a very very long list <laughs> now you've identified your extra soft costs let's say you needed staff overnight to watch out on the deck make sure that no crazy people are stepping in you needed extra administration and obviously you need your permits that takes you to your total, but we're missing an extremely important step, contingency. So you can go next. Your budget is not completed until you add in your contingency. As a rule of thumb on a project that is low risk, uh, you can use a lower contingency on a project that is high cost, high risk, you would use a higher contingency. And that takes you to your grand total. Wow. So you can go next. Oh my God. Say what? That's the face that most people will give you after they see $50,000 for just one barbecue. Now that being said, they may come back and say, wait a minute. There is no way. $50,000 for a barbecue and this is where you would use and change approach. You would use your design to budget approach. Go next, Sully. Right, I think you've done enough talking, so I'll go oh, now. Thanks. <laughs> but um, so design to budget. So yeah, you did the whole whoa. You did oh my god, I can't go back to my comedian and tell him what a barbecue is going to cost me fifty six thousand dollars. It's it's a little insane. I mean, unless you can, if you can, more power to you. But now we think about let's let's try a different method. Let's try this whole design to a budget. Now, you know, it doesn't mean that you have to go per se uglier. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know budget, I need something uglier. It doesn't technically mean that, but it may mean that you have to maybe, I don't know, adjust quantities, uh, quality a little bit, you know, eliminate certain items, you know, those extra items that, you know, made you look cool to your neighboring building. Eh, you may not be so cool. Mm -hmm. You'll have a barbecue. You just may not be the cool kid on the block. Uh, so next slide, Suli. So now in design to budget, it, we're going to go through this, but the sim simplest way to do it, it's, it's basically reverse. You're taking everything you did before you started with an idea, a vision, then you went to a design and you bid out that design and it ended up all the way at the bottom. Once you had contract, you ended up with your cost and you added a contingency to that. Well, in this case, we're going we're gonna to do the opposite. We're going to say, okay, we want to build a barbecue, but we cannot spend more than X amount of dollars. So we're going to get X amount of dollars and say, this is our budget. And from that budget, now we're going to go down and say, okay, well, now we need contingency. And we extract contingency because you have to do it in reverse. You have the budget. The first thing we need is contingency. You have $50,000 budget. Well, if you're going to take out 10%, you're getting your 5K and you're putting it to the side and say, now we have 45 before we continue because we need that five to protect ourselves in case we go a little over. Can you go to the next slide, Sully? Okay, so yeah, you could populate it. So in order to establish your budget, you're going to need to consider where the funding is coming from to complete your project. You know, how much have you have available in reserves for the project? Um, you know, what's one of the big things we say is what's your threshold for pain? 
basically we want to understand, you know, where can you not go? Where do you want to go? And where can you absolutely just not surpass? That's what we really need to know. You know, it, for a special assessment that your owners can somewhat stomach, especially when it comes to something like this, uh, do you have the funds in your operating account? And that could can it be purpose for this project? Because that's obviously you got to make sure whether it's reserves or operating, you got to make sure it's can be purpose for that. Uh, have you received a settlement amount or insurance claim? You know, basically you just got an extra boost of money and you're like, you know, we don't know what to do with it. So we need to understand where you're getting the money from. Um, and that's something obviously you as a project property manager or a board member, or even us, when we go in there, we ask these questions and it's understanding that because in order to establish that budget, you got to know where you're getting the money from. You know, get all your ducks in a row per se. So if you go to the next slide, silly. But basically here, you know, we have the calm the bottom line. So we know that's a big expense coming out with the 40 recertification, but their current grew is small and doesn't work. And they want people to be able to cook on this deck. And we're going back to the same idea of a barbecue. They took a look at the reserves, the budget, their operational budget, and what the threshold for paying was. And they said, you know what? Our budget's $35,000. Now, you go to the next slide, Suli. So basically, just as I mentioned earlier, you're taking now that $35,000 and you're doing a reverse. You say, okay, well, let's pull contingency. Contingency is that 10%. So now that 10% is $3,500. Go to the next slide, Sully. You got it? I can't tell. No. So you got yep. the next? Oh, there it goes. All right. So now we got design costs. So now we're just working reverse. Now that we have $31,500 for a project of that, of that size, now your design cost could be less. Maybe you could even do it yourself something small, you know, Home Depot type deal. But let's say you have a consulting designer on site already for another project. So you ask that individual, look, we need to add a couple hours of time to assess this for that, for fuel, concern, safety, whatever. Can you please give us a price? And now that designer comes back. So now we're plugging in our $6,000. $6,000, these are the balance of $25,500. Let me go to the next slide, silly. So now we go to our soft cost. Now that we have that... We're plugging in that staff overtime of 40 hours, 800 administrative permits now we're, for a total of 3,300. Now we're down to $22,200. Mm -hmm. So now when you come back and you go back and you go to the next slide, Sully. There you go. So now you're saying create a hard beat for hard cost. The mentality changed a little bit. You went from that original beautiful picture that I think that Heidi showed you earlier on the slide, which looked amazing to saying, you know, Home Depot has a special now for Christmas coming up. And I got a, you know, a little car I got for last Christmas I've never used for 50 bucks. So we really want to invest in it. We're going to go this route. You know, you work with what you got. I mean, not per se that, but, you know, ideas of what you could actually do. You work within your budget. You don't just say you have an open checkbook. It doesn't matter. We're ready to go all the way. This is the other way around. This is saying, I have a budget. I got to stick to my budget. I'm willing. We are willing to do this barbecue area if we could get it within this price. Essentially, what can you give me for $22,000? So then you go to the end, the next slide. Now, the next slide you have here, the breakdown. You started with 35, removed the contingency, balance of 31.5, design, you kept going on and on, plugged in those soft costs. You got the hard cost of $22,000. By the way, $22,000, it's not what, it got you more in the last photo. That's, that's an expensive barbecue. <laughs> But either way, you go down, you have all these areas, and you have a remaining balance of 200 bucks. Now, your remaining balance of 200 bucks plus your contingency. So, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, if something goes south a little bit on there, you know, you need a gas line or something else, you got to move it or pick some flooring because of the barbecue. You have the money, you have the cushion there to help you. Now, basically, here, all we're doing is taking that reverse method and transferring it over. So, we're starting, we're going the opposite and building it here. The hard cost to grow and other items that have been chosen are then subtracted from the remaining funds after the contingency design and soft cost deducted. The resulting balance is zero, which in this case is fine. You're within the budget limits established and designed to budget process. And basically, it's how it works. And we go here. Next slide, Sully. Oh, two slides, Sully. Is she in? Right there. And here you have your, you know, side by side. So despite the goal, we end up with two budgets by using different processes. Both meet the needs of the association, needs being a barbecue area. And both give you control over the project process. You So you build a proper budget on both. 
It's not that one budget is correct. The other is not. They're different methods. Mm -hmm. You went through the steps. You understood the steps. It's just you went about it two different ways. Now, depending on the project, the budgeting methods give you the tools to get your association what they want or what they need, which at the end of the day, we always tell our clients that we need to separate the needs from the wants. Correct. Because needs at time are budget to design. Yep. Because they're a need. You got to do it. You got to do the concrete restoration. You got to do the fire sprinkler job or the roof replacement or the windows for insurance mm -hmm. purposes, whatever it may be. The wants are, you know, I just want a barbecue every for no reason. And just to give you an example on that, I have a project, right, where the ELSS system was required, the HVAC was required. Right? So those are projects that are just requirements. You have to spend the money that's a budget to design project, right? But what happens when we install the sprinkler system, the fire alarm, the HVAC? There is no reflective ceiling in this property. What goes back? Are we going to have an industrial look? No. So the need was we have to, on this beautification project, we have to, have to, have to construct a reflective ceiling and do, and do new lighting on the ceiling. It's required in order to cover what was required to put in by the city. But out of that, we separated the needs, reflective ceiling with lights to cover what is being installed and the wants. The association wanted to add new paint to the walls, new baseboards, new hardware to the doors, replace the doors, make them pretty, make them new, new pit holes, new everything. So we separated needs from wants. Are we sure that we have the needs met? Do we have the money for the needs? Yes, okay. This is what's left over. What can we cover from that with the wants? And we went through a selection process. Next slide, Silly. All right. So this is basically the same budget we've all been talking about. Maybe the, you know, a little more complicated than the simplified version you just saw before this. But you can really make a budget as complicated or not complicated as you want. What makes sense to you? Here, the way we break it down is you, you break it down, you have design costs. An additional soft cost. So again, that's all under soft cost. But we start with design cost, and we have then we add our consultants, administrative. That same breakdown we gave you earlier, kind of what you could use to go through it. So we generate this entire soft cost, and we have our total. Now, one thing you're going to notice on this particular budget, again, because it was built for this presentation to simplify things, you're going to notice that even after hard cost, we have a line item for contingency where it shows a twenty percent mm -hmm. at the bottom. It's line item twenty nine. Project contingency of 20%. But as I mentioned earlier, we typically will have a line item above, right under soft cost, showing a temp, whatever percent contingency we want to put for soft cost, and then a separate one for hard cost. We want to understand the two. And at the bottom of our budget, we'll add the totals. Now we're going to add the totals for just the base soft cost and hard cost. So we know what that total is. And then we're going to add the totals of the soft cost with his contingency and hard cost with contingency and add those two so we know what that is. Mm -hmm. When you add those two at the end, which is you plugged in your contingency to both, that is your budget. I get asked a lot of times on associations, they say, well, we're, you know, we're at the end of a job, but we're surpassing our budget. And I say, well, we're actually not. We're within budget. And they say, well, no, but, you know, that's what, you know, our contingency is not supposed to be used. And I said, no, your contingency is part of your budget. It was put in there. Hopes are you don't have to, but it is part of your budget. Mm -hmm. You've assessed for that amount. You've gotten a loan for that amount. This is part of your budget. The fact that we were able to value engineer so many things and save money along the way, even though we had these change orders and whatnot, the fact that it went a little over the, the true cost, the original hard cost, because that was what the contractor gave you, but we're still within budget. We're within that contingency. That's why it's there for you. Yeah. It's there to capture those unknown throughout the process. Uh, so the next slide. So this basically what it is, is a complicated detailed budget. This is the one we just showed you is generated by us using this. You don't have to do this. We do this because it's how we build it. We have to really know the details of it. And by the details, I mean, you can see, you may not be able to see this too clear, but some of what it says, for example, demolition or show flooring, tile, the square footage, the unit cost for that you know, an extension of what that gives us. And at the end of floor, you know, floor tile, you know, it's X. We're going to break that down. We want to know every detail about it. We want to know how we came up with our number. And typically we, we build this in the back 
And so then when presenting the simplified version, the one prior to this, which is just the roundup, call it the overall project budget, just showing the total numbers and total values, we have the backup to support it. Mm -hmm. So again, this is just to show you an example, I mean, of the steps that we take to really get to what we need. Uh, the next step, Suli. So basically right here, if you can master these two concepts, which is budget to design and design to a budget, can not only present your associations with viable options to allow for informed and responsible decision making, but your projects will run more smoothly. They will, because you have a good understanding of what they are. You've anticipated the, the, the hiccups down the road, you know, the pitfalls, you've gone around them because you did that process of understanding a project and what it takes to actually get from beginning to end. Uh, you, you know, you're able to now to avoid the surprises and avoid those cost overruns. So with that, you'll end up looking like a superstar. And if you which is right there. And we actually, um, it's its a little embarrassing, but we train our employees to do that exact, you know, that pose, those dance, you know, mm -hmm. Heidi, Heidi? No? Mm -hmm. no, no, where I want to. Nope. I've been told no. Yes. But yes, you would be a superstar if you made it to the end. Uh, so at this point, Suli, the next slide is, I uh, want to go ahead and, and ask you some questions. I know we just took some time, so I'm happy to take some questions. Hi. So if you guys have any questions, you're more than welcome to put them into the chat. We'll be able to answer them for you. Um, I know a few of you were asking about a copy of the presentation. And yes, we'll be able to provide uh, the copy of the presentation. Just send me an email. I put in my email uh, in the chat. It's suli at dssconda.com. Um, forget about the keyword budget. We're not using that anymore. That was just in order to get you the... Um, the CEU credit, but you won't need that. You will get your CAM license. Just make sure that you did uh, include your CAM license when you register. Uh, Peggy will provide me with your information. and We will um, get you your uh, credit to the DBPR. Um, now, you have any questions? Like I said, the presentation we will send over. Just make sure you send me an email. You have any questions about the, the, uh, the budget or anything that we presented today? Uh, we do have time. Uh, it's supposed to be a two hour. We, you know, we were very efficient today uh, with our class because normally it does take two hours uh, for the class. So I guess we, even with the technical difficulties, I guess we were a little bit um, efficient with the class. Silly, are there any questions in the Q and A? I'm actually uh, looking. Through, I'm looking through that now. A lot I of the see. questions were an, were answered. A lot okay. of them about sharing yeah. the presentation. Yeah, I see one that says some capital improvement required membership vote to approve. Uh, check documents in advance. So it was not a question. It was more of an, uh, a statement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. We approximate twenty to twenty five percent of the total. Yeah. Another one in here said, "Would you say that contingency allowance would be a, uh, approximate twenty to twenty five percent of the total budget?" Again, it goes back, as I mentioned, the type of project mm -hmm. you're doing, the uncertainty, the unknowns, the conditions. You know, there, there are simple, like the project that was described here, the barbecue. You know, if you know the area, it's a flat area on grade, and you're just putting in a barbecue area, the unknowns are, li are very limited. Correct. There's not many, so your continues to be much lower. You could always put more, but again, unfortunately, that takes from your budget or adds to it, and now you're assessing for that amount. So mm -hmm. it's, it's very dependent on the type of project and the condition. Okay. So we have question. okay. Mm -hmm. So there's another question here that says, when you're doing something like converting from gas appliance to electric appliance, what is the best way to estimate future operating costs? Well, what we do with that when you you know okay, so when you're doing something like converting from a gas appliance to an electric appliance, what is the best way to estimate? If you're going to try to estimate maintenance costs, call your operating costs for that moving forward. We do a little more of a deep dive to understand it, where we go back to understand exactly what that piece of equipment it pulls when it comes to electrical. We understand, you know, we speak to you because, you know, how often is that piece of equipment going to be used, the operation of that equipment to try to establish some numbers for you. So it's it's more investigation, more math, basically building that for you to, to understand and have at least an idea of what that's going to cost you operating costs down the road. So Richard um, was asking if we provide owner representation for a structural project, and Richard, the answer will be yes. Yes, we uh, do. A, any type of project that you have. So send me an email, uh, Suli at dsscondo.com, and we can definitely be in touch. I have a question. 
Okay. Let's say your assessment is uh, $100,000 or whatever it is. <clears throat> I'm sorry, your uh, contingency. If at the end of the project you have that contingency left over, uh, do they normally return that back to the residents? In my experience, honestly, I've, it, that's happened, uh, you know, where there's a, a big chunk of money left yeah. over in contingency. It's happened maybe twice, two or three times. You, typically, we, we go, you know, there's only a very small percentage of it left because of the project. But typically what they do is when something's left like that, they don't, they haven't given it back to the residents. They reinvested in it. They'll add to the project and say, well, what can we do? And that's what Heidi was mentioning yeah. earlier when they had a budget and said, okay, we got, we have the needs out of the way. What, you know, now we have X amount left over. What can we do with this for our wants? You know, additional FF&E, you know, which is you know, some more paintings in the hallways or yeah. whatever it may be. And Maybe actually, art, yeah, et cetera. Sort of art, things like uh, that. Generally speaking, what we generally find and and it becomes an issue for us it's board of directors especially will automatically see let's say we're halfway through the project and 90 percent of our contingency is left they'll come in and say oh my god we got money left over let's spend it oh my god my bathrooms can look prettier my lobby could use a new chandelier we can add lighting and a new backsplash and they'll want to expand it immediately it's very, very few projects that will wait until the end of the project to not spend their contingency. And something that we tell all of our boards and all of our property managers is act like your contingency does not exist until the end of the project or until you truly, truly have to use it. It's like a money that is invisible. It's there. We know it's there. We can use it if we need it. It doesn't exist until it has to be used. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. But Peggy, so um, to answer your question from the property management side, uh, so if there is money left over on a special assessment, especially, you know, if they did ask for a special assessment and they do have some money left over at the end of the project, um, they, you know, the board needs to um, reevaluate how to use that money because it was meant for one project and now they have, um, some money left over so you you think yeah they should give it back so rare occasion they will uh, give it back because you know there's going to be some other projects that will come along the way so it would make no sense to give it back and they're going to have to ask for money again so all they do is use they use call meeting and they just say okay we have x amount of dollars and we have this other project coming up so we're just going to use this for the next project so that way we don't have to ask you for money again because we have this funds left over uh from project x now we're going to use it for project y so your money is well spent so that's basically all they have to do okay thank you okay so well, uh well i i guess you know uh yeah i know it was a two-hour presentation but i guess you guys will have some uh additional free time uh with, to go with the rest of your day so if no one has any uh additional questions i i, I think we're good to go Okay, well, then I'll close it out here. Uh, I want to say thank you both to Michael and Heidi. Uh, outstanding presentation because of the information is invaluable. Uh, I'm sure you're going to be getting many requests for that list of uh, soft costs because a lot of people like to say don't. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I get that. <laughs> yeah, you kind of take things for granted. And there goes the contingency right out the door, right? Exactly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> All righty. Thank but, you, uh, I do want to say uh, we do have some upcoming webinars in October. The dates will be announced, but we are starting out with October 4th. Uh, that is still tentative, but it is going to be with Scott Lee of uh, SJ Law Service, SJW Law Services, which is going to be a board certification and uh, coordination with Hafer Company, the CPA service. Uh, they're going to speak on some financial tips. So I uh, look forward to seeing you. In October. Thanks again to all the sponsors and uh, look for your sponsor sheet with all their contact information and the recording link. Okay. Thanks right. so much. Oh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Peggy. Thank, thank you, everyone. Bye. You're welcome. Bye-bye.